Yeah, so I'm kind of thinking that um, in the course of that time, yeah, the moon's probably been terraformed maybe a couple of times. It probably also, well, there's a lot of things about the, a billion years, and, and I don't know how much you guys want me to go off on this, right? But actually, the, the, the sun's luminosity had, will have increased in a billion years by about 10%, which will basically make life on Earth as we know it completely impossible. So somebody must have at some point done something to the sun to keep that from happening. We also probably should have, in a billion years, probably should have lost the moon. Um, and that clearly didn't happen because there's still a moon in the sky. Um, and, you know, uh, there's interesting things, you know, you know, has Mars been terraformed? And, and there's, there's also some interesting things that I want to play around with because um, some of the past could have had teleportation technology. So it's possible that, like, the player characters might go into a place and then come out on Mars or on the other side of the galaxy or, you know, who knows where, right? In a, in a completely different reality. Um, you know, the possibilities are so endless and I think that's, I think that's really fun. Yeah. Um, now, it's very open-ish gaming. Will there be enough rules so even, like, the rules lawyers will be happy where they can say, well, it should be this because it states here that X equals Y or whatever? Um, I mean, there, there, are, there are hard and fast rules, right? I mean, it... Because uh, I, you know, I have a it, rules lawyer in our group, and sure. he is, lives and dies by the text. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it's the, it, I mean, it's, it's the kind of game where if you are, if you are fighting uh, this particular NPC, you know, you've got stats, he's got stats, it tells you what dice to roll and whether you should hit him or not and how much damage you do, right? I mean, it's, it's a game, right? Um, but the sort of both built into the mechanics itself, like I was talking about with the GM intrusion, but also with just sort of the style of play, it's kind of encouraged that... Um, I, so I am a big fan of something that kind of got a little bit lost in the last 15 years or so of, of gaming, and that is... The role-playing part? The, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, oh, well, uh, but, but what I was actually going to say was was the the power of the game master, um, the ability uh, for the game master to sort of say this is the way um, this is the way that this happens, right? Um, whether you call it GM fiat or whatever, and I'm not talking about I'm the DM, so I'm God, right? And I'm not talking about you know, well, it's me versus the DM, and the DM's always going to win. I'm not talking about that kind of role playing. I'm just talking about. Um, a, a time when the, the Game Master, you know, if you look back at, you know, the early versions of D&D &D and whatnot, it's, it's really about the Game Master using his role, which is different from everyone else's role at the table, to make sure that a cool adventure is happening in a fantasy world, you know, that, that he, has, he or she has the power to uh, kind of overrule the rules. Right, and I think that we've kind of lost that. We've kind of put the rules as being more important than the game master. Numenera is going to be more, uh, you know, the rules are important, but the game master can trump the rules. It's more important. Yeah. And the other follow-up question is: is I know if if it was on your website or the Kickstarter, that there's going to be little to no rules for miniatures. Um, Actually, no. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm actually going to do is probably put like an appendix or something at the back that actually there will be rules for managers. Uh, so if, you, if you want to pull out minis, um, you know I don't I don't know if I don't know if it'll happen. Um, but right now I'm talking to uh, Fat Dragon Games. If you're familiar with them, they make paper terrain. Um, they were talking about maybe doing some Numenera specific paper terrain. You know, with some cool weird technology stuff that you can build. Um, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm talking to a couple of different miniatures companies that are really interested. Because, you know, it's just got such an interesting look. I think yeah. it's attracted a lot of people. Um, and I love miniatures, so I'm not going to say no to that for sure. Most people like the aspect of the technical part of can you see, can you not see. Right, right. So Makes it consistent. I definitely, uh, if, if you want to make, use miniatures, I want to I wanna give you the ability to do so. Um, but right now, when I play Numenera, I do not use miniatures of any kind. Um, we're just sitting around a table, uh, and that works great. 
Um, so you can you can play either way. Yep. What's been your experience with uh, using sort of state as yourself as opposed to actually having uh publisher and get them to buy into um those two things are night and day. Um, uh, my experience with Kickstarter so far has been really, really good. Um, uh, I think that e even before I launched this Kickstarter, well, you know, and I did a, a Kickstarter for Geek Seekers um, about eight months ago, which went well as well. Um, but Kickstarter hadn't really taken off then. Um, but even before I did the Kickstarter, I, I wrote about crowdfunding in general. I think crowdfunding is great. And the reason is, is that I can look on Kickstarter every day and I can see stuff that would not get published if they had to go the traditional route, but it's getting funded, right? So what that's saying is that it's something that people want, right? But it's the kind of thing that they're not seeing through the traditional models, right? Because <coughs> the traditional model is by sort of its very definition, it has to be very conservative, right? Because you can't take a lot of risks with the the regular model of, and by that I mean publisher, distributor, retailer, right? Which is, I, I'm, not, I'm not against that model, right? And, and, and you know, I'm gonna be selling uh, Numenera into distribution and you know, you'll see it in your game stores in a year. And I think that's great. And I'm a big supporter of game stores and um, especially game stores, you know, that really cater to their customers and provide play space and you know, know what they're talking about and you know, I. I some of my favorite places in the world are game stores. So I'm all for that. Um, but I'm also really excited about uh, Kickstarter and, and other crowdsourcing stuff because, because it's a way for the creator to talk directly to the people who are going to be using his product and say, is this of interest to you? And if a lot of people say yes, then it gets made, right? And it sort of seems like that's the way it should have worked forever, you know, um, rather than, you know, it's having, having worked on the, on the publisher end for 25 years, there's been a lot of guesswork, you know, oh, I think people will like this product, right, and then you put it out there, and maybe you were right, maybe you were wrong, right, um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it, I hope, um, and, and strongly suspect that it, it is, it is here to stay, um, whether that, whether that form will be Kickstarter forever, I don't know. Right? Kickstarter works really well. Um, I haven't had any big problems with it, but there are also other crowdsourcing things going on too. So it's exciting. It's a really, I, I mean, if you've looked at Kickstarter, actually, games in general, particularly if you also lump in um, computer games and video games, are a huge segment of Kickstarter. It is definitely really invigorated gaming. Um, in well, really interesting ways. Kickstarter almost comes close to what I remember as being a Patreon system from a long time ago. Exactly. Where, like, money, it's like, I don't want to mention this because everybody benefits from it. But, you know. it yeah, it, it is very much like that. Um, but it's even a step better, right? Because now you don't need a rich person. You just need a bunch of regular people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you already touched on Pat Dragon Games. You touched a little bit on your thoughts on third party support for Numenera. And, you know, it, and also, I know you have a big passion for this. It's, it's obvious it's infectious out here. Um, what do you think about novels? Um, well, so to address your second question first, um, one of the new stretch goals for the Kickstarter is actually um, not a novel, but uh, I think, I don't remember what their level is, but basically the reward is I drop everything that I'm doing and I write a, an introductory short story that I make immediately available to everybody. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, I, uh, I took a break from uh, role-playing game design a few years ago to focus on fiction. Um, and I wrote uh, uh, a lot of stuff, some of which was not so good and some of which was okay. And, uh, in fact, I'm going to be uh, self-publishing a, a collection of fiction uh, here in a couple of months. Um, but I, I think of that as very separate from the game design, but at the same time, I, I will tell you that the setting here uh, is one that really invigorates my imagination, so I, it's definitely something that I can see writing a lot of fiction for, um, both myself and maybe making it available to other people who might be interested. Um, 
uh, I, I have been I've been getting contacted from a lot since the Kickstarter launched. I've been getting contacted by a lot of really interesting people who are interested in having something to do with Human Era. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, I, you know, I, I can't give you a release date or anything like that, but I'd be really surprised if there isn't some Numenera fiction uh, out there eventually, because I, I think it's kind of uh, ripe for that. And I don't remember your first question anymore. Oh, right. Um, so I think that that's really likely. Uh, again, um, a lot of people are in contact with me. A lot of people are interested right now. Uh, what I did for Arcana Unearthed was I created uh, a free limited license that was sort of it basically worked exactly like the OGL, but you had to you had to send me a letter saying, "Hey, here's what we're doing." Um, and the only reason that I did that was so that uh, uh, we had a, a just a modicum of of, of control. Uh, you know, I never once said no to anybody. Uh, but, but, you know, if somebody came to me and said, you know, I want to create a Numenera source book about killing babies, I'd probably say, mm, could you think of maybe a different topic? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's the only reason that I did it that way. Uh, it's quite possible that we'll put something like that together for Numenera. It's also possible that what we'll do is we'll make that available after some short amount of time. Like, it might not be on launch. Uh, but... I'm, I'm a big fan and a, and a big supporter of the idea of making things open like that, so it's, it's very, very likely. Yep. First off, read the model of the library. Everything you said about the logic here is amazing. Like, I, I, I have forever played a game where you're trying to come up with really creative uses of your incredibly limited resources, especially at lower levels, like in old school, for instance. Uh, Mage priest dig and uh, grease. Why they have a huge party of water rushing on. <laughs> really, just and then stuff like and then later on it's like you can't do that because it's not in the rules. Right. But, well, I, 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 <laughs> and you, you, you just have this at it's like you, you have these very limited resources, so at lower levels like the the best thing you can do is just use what you have as creatively as possible. Right. And the crush explosion in many Seems like it's designed against that, so it's you can't because there's no rule for it. Right. You can't do that. And then there are GMs who I don't know if they're not comfortable with not the system or not comfortable enough with the rule of GM and say, you know what, that makes perfect sense to me. I don't care what the rule says, do it. Right. Awesome, roll some dice. Um, and then what you were talking about on there is that's the kind of system you want. So if you hear anything like that, I'm gonna <laughs> So um yeah, so I can tell you exactly why you see games that have trended away from that in the last 15 years or so. And it's, it's to avoid rules arguments, right? Because you just say, well, is it, does, what does the rule say? Does it say that you can use grease for that? Well, it, then no, you can't, right? But, you know, I had so much fun in the early days of, of role playing where basically the first rule of the game was logic and then after that came the actual rules printed in the game and so you know you had but it it requires the dm or the gm to be an arbiter of of that logic and so it requires a little bit of skill and it requires maybe a little bit of training um and so you know i'm happy to try to provide that kind of advice to people so that they know how to do that but yeah i definitely I can't, I can't imagine writing a role-playing game now that doesn't heavily rely on the, the game master's wielding of logic, right? That regardless of what the rule book says, right, does it make sense, right? Because you're dealing with um, a simulation of something. Right? It might not be the simulation of reality. It might be the simulation of fiction. It might be the simulation of, of you know, if you're playing Toon, it might be the simulation of Warner Brothers cartoons, right? But there's a simulation of something. And I think that it's the Game Master's role to be the arbiter of that um, and to kind of dictate what works and what doesn't, not the printed rules. Um, our 
Park the Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Park the Second is around the local gaming store, not the park. Cool. Sounds great. Okay, cool. Yeah. In terms of the creative process, did you come up with the mechanics and then you know develop the setting around the mechanics that you wanted to run, or did you have a vision of the world and then decide that you know, these are the kind of mechanics I wanted to express that the world is? It's a difficult question to answer because um, some of the mechanics. I, I guess the technical answer to your question is I came with the mechanics first because there, there are mechanics in Numenera, specifically the effort uh, mechanic that I talked about, that I came up with about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, then was hired by TSR and just kind of put it, on, put it in a drawer and didn't really think about it again until a couple of years ago. And uh, started working on what became Numenera uh, a couple of years ago then I got hired by Wizards of the Coast again, or they got brought back as a contractor by Wizards of the Coast again, put it all in a drawer again. Um, and then when uh, I stopped working for Wizards, uh, I pulled it all back out again. Um, so the mechanics, I guess, came first. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because they're so integrated now. It's difficult for me to think of them as separately. Like, when I first started working on Numenera, um, I, I was actually thinking, <laughs> I was actually thinking that, that the setting, that the whole idea of science fantasy and super far future and the setting and everything would appeal to no one but me and like three other people. So um, my plan was that I was going to release Numenera and then when that didn't go over so well. I was going to uh, take the rule system and put it in a more put it in a more traditional fantasy setting, and then say, you know, well now you've got two different settings for the game. So uh, I guess from an early stage, I did think that it the rules could be divorced from the setting, um, but now, well now a it looks like looks like at least some people are pretty interested in the same kind of crazy science fantasy that I am. Um, and also, uh, you know, in my mind, they've just become so fused. They could probably be pulled apart again, but it takes some work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you enjoy more working for yourself or working for another company? Myself. I, I've done both. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done both. I've done both roads. I freelance and work staff for different companies, and then I've also written for myself. Uh -huh. It's been a mixed bag. Um. So, I, I've told this story before. Um, this was the first time uh, that I left Wizards of the Coast back in two, early 2001. Um, I was sitting in my manager's office and we were just chatting about whatever. Um, and I looked down at his desk and um, on, the, on the desk was this stack of papers that were clipped together and I said, what's that? And he said, uh, oh, that's the manuscript for Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil, which I had written. And I said, what's this piece of paper on top? And he said, that's the sign-off sheet. He said, everyone, before, before this can go uh, to the printer, everyone on this sheet has to sign off on it. And there were 17 names on that sheet, and I only knew who two of them were. <laughs> and it was right then and there I said, there's, from my point of view, the way I look at creative work, there's something wrong here. Um, you know, at, at any point, somebody who I don't even know, I don't even know what their job is, could say, I mean, they, they didn't do this, right? But they could have said, you know, there's just too many knolls in Encounter 57 here, you know? Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a big proponent of the creative vision and, and, have, having a creative person you know, come up with an idea and, and take it to its end and, and put it in front of people and, and see if they like it. You know, I'm, I'm not against collaboration. Um, 
when, when I worked on third edition D&D &D with uh, Jonathan Tweet and Skip Williams, um, probably the best professional experience that I've had in my life, right? Um, fun, uh, grew as a, as a uh, designer almost immeasurably. Um, I, it was just so valuable, so rewarding. Very great experience. So I don't, I don't, I'm not naysaying that. I'm not naysaying working for a company, but, but I will say that for me, um, the idea, the, the, the whole idea that one, one person can come up with an idea and really be given the ability to, to flesh it out and make it into something real without a committee coming in and telling you what you have to do and what you can't do and, and uh, that, it's just invaluable, right? Just for, just for my own well, mental well-being. <laughs> yeah? Uh, from your previous experience, like the third edition, is there any rules that you publish where you're like, I shouldn't have made that rule later, like where it was too confusing for people? Um, like when, when I first started out with third edition, I had to read, read You're not going to say grapple, are you? Text. Okay. <laughs> like 20 times before I totally understood it. Sure. Um, if I sat down and thought about it, there's probably stuff like that. Um, but when I think about things like that, I think more in terms of kind of a gestalt, right, of, of not just like a specific single rule, but kind of an overall philosophy. Here's the thing that third edition doesn't say that it should have said from day one. Nowhere in that game does it say um, the DM can overrule any of this, right? There was a thing in the, in the originally uh, uh, called Rule Zero, which actually got excised uh, 3.5, which was check with your GM when you're making your character um, and, and run, run it all by him, which is, is, is pretty good. But, you know, the thing is, is that remember how I was saying when we designed third edition, we, we put in rules for everything. Um, and we, we really codified that system. And, and that's not a bad thing, in my opinion. But we did that so that, that gamers didn't have, didn't have to guess if they didn't want to. But what it should have then said was, you know, GM, once you've got, once you've got your footing, once you know what you're doing and you can just start to make logical decisions on the fly and how things work, and you don't want to look up, you don't want to stop the game and look it up every time, you don't have to. And so that's, that's kind of a rules design regret that I have. Um, it's not exactly the answer to your question, but it, it's definitely what comes to my mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, I guess, every edition of D&D, &D, um, religion is real because a cleric casts a spell and it works. Right. It's and hard to be an atheist when you see about, that happen. Um, arcane on Earth and Arcane Evolved. Being a priest is a feat that gives you certain social standing or certain social aspects, but it's not, it doesn't have the crunch that you find in the other. Right. Given, and have kind of read your description of why you came up with the name of Numenera, what elements of, well, I put better word, religion, are in the setting or could be in the setting if the, the people playing want to use it that way? Well, so, um, that's, that's an interesting topic. Um, there are certainly religions in the Ninth World, uh, and there are certainly, uh, because remember I said the world is very fractured, so you might go to one area and find followers of a religion and go to another area and it's a completely different religion. You know, how weird is that? Um, imagine different people in different parts of the world with different religions. Um, but uh, it, is uh, we, we in Numenera, so some of that, if, if they're worshiping a god, is that god, is that god real? You don't know, right? It would be just a matter of faith. But in, because it's Numenera, is this god actually an artificial intelligence left over some, from some prior civilization that has achieved some energy state of solid state material that can, you know, can actually interact in the world of his worshipers, you know? Um, and 
is, and if that being really is, even though it's an artificial intelligence, even if it wields those kind, if it does wield those kind of powers, is it a god? You know, what is a god, right? I mean, there's interest, just like uh, Numenera raises some interesting questions about um, what it means to be human. Um, because there are so many things that could potentially take you away from our standard definition of humanity that in the ninth world they would still call human. Well, it raises questions like, you know, what is a god? And, and things like that as well, right? If it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of really interesting things that you can do um, with, with Numenera and religions, um, I think. I, I, I think we're going to have fun exploring that. Yeah? What's your favorite or one of your favorite moments in the game today? What's the worst of the last five minutes? All right, you want a long story? I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry.
toward the end here. Yeah? Uh, scions? Like this version, that old version of an Asimov, for instance. Oh, oh, um, yes. Um, so, uh, without getting into a lot of boring detail, there's, uh, there are sort of some, so I recognize that there are two kinds of, two kinds of role players, right? They're the people who want to get a character made and get playing. And there are the kind of people who really want to tinker with their character and, and make, you know, not just make three choices to design their character. They want to, you know, really sculpt this character. So Numenera is going to um, uh, cater to both. And so while the, the core of the game is based around this three choice method of character creation, they're going to be um, sort, of, sort of an optional rule set that if you want, you can really tinker. And one of the things that you can tinker around with is, in fact, race. Um, because standard, most, most everyone is human, whatever that means. But uh, there is this idea that there might be some kind of leftover uh, hidden enclaves of, of aliens uh, who are actually not native to Earth at all. Um, then you could potentially play them. Um, and there's the potential that you could play someone who is sort of the equivalent of being, you know, plain touched or, or a tiefling or an asimar, but they wouldn't necessarily have like a like demon or angel heritage. It might be more alien or extra dimensional, um, and it might not be a direct genetic lineage kind of thing. It could be something like, you know, your grandfather mysteriously disappeared and no one knows what happened to him, and when he came out. You know, he was changed somehow, right? And maybe he was abducted by aliens. Maybe he was, you know, fell into a weird experimental lab. You know, there's really kind of almost no limit to the kinds of things that could mess around with, with somebody's genetics and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, a lot of cool ideas. Is there another question? Or some, no? You've been told not to? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, if, if that, you know, uh, we don't have to, just, I'm just going to put one thing, you know, uh, uh, don't have to just talk about Numenera. Um, if you guys want to, one last chance, ask me questions about third edition or Talus or anything. Okay, um, if that's the case, um, then uh, if you guys have, like, books to sign or whatever, uh, now would be a good time. And for everybody else, thank you so much for uh, sharing the agenda. Really appreciate it. Um, Numenera.com. Uh, Kickstarter. <laughs>